Your teachers told you that looks don't matter and it's what's inside that counts. While advertisers sold you products to make you attractive enough to love. Your buddy in high school told you good guys finish last, but all the movies you watched growing up showed the good guy getting the girl. And lately, your social media feed is just filled with men bemoaning hookup culture and saying they wouldn't date women who participate while they themselves engage in it. In other words, you're just getting bombarded with contradictory messages about dating. And while dating can feel like politics or philosophy, where there are just no factually right answers, really, in those domains, you can kind of just end the conversation by saying agree to disagree. This is an empirical area, human mating behavior. Just as in the mating behavior of any other species, there will be sensible and nonsensical ideas. And we can separate the wheat from the chaff in the same way we would were we talking about any other animal, by sincerely testing the predictions of our ideas, of our hypotheses, by running studies, and then analyzing the data. Today's episode is a long discussion about the science of human mating behavior that I don't personally think is appropriate for children, but parents, you know best. The topics we discuss include what men and women want, uh, what they get wrong about what the opposite sex wants, hypergamy or the concept of hypergamy and where it meets reality, scary versus sexy traits in men, including tattoos and masculine faces, an audit of the red pill and the manosphere. And if you don't know what those terms refer to, it might be best to just stop listening before we get to them. We also talk about the maybe mating crisis, and we wrap up with some data-driven dating advice. Now, there are very few topics where I have the appropriate academic background to have a vague sense for what's wheat and what's chaff, it might sound strange, but this topic actually is one of them. I research human mating behavior at the University of Melbourne. I focused on human mating behavior probably too much during my MSc at Oxford, and I've been a student of this topic in the background of this podcast for as long as I've been doing it, and that's come through a few times on the show. So I'm quite confident in saying that today's guest has been consistently putting out wheat on the topic of human mating. I found a Twitter account last August that had maybe 600 followers. Might have been lower, might have been 400. Definitely less than 1,000 in any case. It was an unusual find because despite the objectively quite low following and very little engagement, we're talking like a couple likes on each tweet, the account, at date psych, was posting daily threads of often dozens of tweets cleverly and accurately reviewing swaths of literature on dating. Really just home run after home run science communication, completely unrecognized. For someone who isn't in my field, it's probably hard to communicate how weird this was. I think for you guys, it would be like if you discovered an artist on Spotify, listened to their albums to find some of the best new music you'd heard in years, and then notice that despite the clear quality and large discography, they had almost no listens, right? They're playing to an empty stadium or an empty digital stadium. Well, in any case, since last August, uh, this account that I'm referring to gained some 20,000 followers. The stadium has very much filled up for at date psych. Alexander the man behind the account and his popular blog, datepsychology.com, is a very mysterious person. I don't know his age, even vaguely. I actually don't know his last name. I'm not joking. I know he's a grad student. I know what country he lives in, but I know basically nothing else about this man, except that on this topic, he has a remarkable breadth of knowledge, unusual clarity of thought, and a real aptitude for communicating research in a palatable way on modern platforms, especially Twitter, and today on this podcast. Thank you to all the donors who support this show. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you, Eric and the Animals, for playing me in. Enjoy.
what are men generally looking for in a long-term mate? Like, what's the criterion by which men are actually selecting when it comes to like, okay, which women should I pursue and commit to? Ah, that's a, a, a big question. So one of the big ones is going to be physical attractiveness. So that certainly there's research on sex differences in prioritization of physical attractiveness. Basically, do men care more than women? And typically, the research kind of indicates that that's the case. It's not always the case. Sometimes there's some research that indicates, yeah, maybe women care more than we previously thought, but that's going to be one of the big criteria for men. And uniquely for men, when looking at sex differences for these kind of preferences, it seems to be something that men prioritize almost exclusively. Whereas not only do men prioritize physical attractiveness more in a mate, sometimes it's the only thing that men seem to focus on, kind of to the detriment of other things. I mean, what sort of research tells us this? Is this like interviewing men or is this like watching what men are actually doing in experiments or in like big data studies and stuff like that? Sure. So I guess, I guess this is something that can be kind of observed across methodology and, and across different studies. One example would be uh, research on dating apps where hmm. if you include in the biographies, dating app biographies of men and women, additional information that would make them appear higher status, higher education, this has an effect for women. So for example, if a man's biography says like, ah, he has a master's degree or something, that biography with the same picture will get more swipes or likes or whatever hmm. the case may be. For women, there's basically no effect. If it's associated with higher income, higher education or whatever, basically nothing. Men are just selecting for physical attractiveness. Similarly, there's research on speed dating, right? Where you can get a group of participants, they all come into the lab, they sit in a circle, and then you can have them rate ahead of time, like, what do you want in a partner? A lot of the time people will rate personality kind of high, but then when it comes down to actual selection, physical attractiveness kind of comes out at the top. And that's one methodology that we see that women actually select pretty highly for physical attractiveness, at least in that very initial dating environment with someone that they don't otherwise know very much about. Okay, and how do women, other than that, how do women differ from men in selecting long-term mates? So in particular for selecting long-term mates, uh, David Buss has a good article about this in the recent Oxford Handbook of Evolutionary Psychology from, from this year, from 2023, but he says, women essentially in searching for long-term mates are looking for the whole package. So they do want someone who's physically attractive. That's important but they also want someone who is showing some sort of stability, so to speak, some ability to provide and to protect. And certainly something, if, if we look aside from what men and women just prioritize to personality traits, then we kind of see similar things for men and women. So in self-reports, at least, both men and women prioritize kindness and loyalty and trustworthiness. Those are things that if you ask people, like, what do you want in a partner, right, their own self-reports, that those are things that are always going to get rated kind of high. Does this change for short-term mates? Do women keep the same preferences? Do men keep the same preferences? I mean, I, I, I'm very much assuming that men are going to still um, put a high premium on physical attractiveness. But in practice, do women actually shift when they're looking for like, you know, something casual or uncommitted or short in duration? Do they shift their mating preferences? Well, certainly this is related to the dual mate hypothesis in evolutionary psychology, the dual mate hypothesis of ovulatory shifts. And that was the idea that, uh, that there was a shift, right? That there was a long-term strategy that men and women had, but we'll talk about women specifically, and that there was a short-term strategy. And for the long-term strategy, it was the idea, okay, that we're going to select someone who is committed in the long term, that's going to be kind of willing to make a long-term bond, help raise the child, provide resources, whereas the short term would be essentially a selection for good genes, which is basically a selection for physical traits and for physical attractiveness. So in that case, the idea was, ah, women should prefer men who are more attractive, who are perhaps physically more muscular, taller, that sort of thing for short term partnerships. Now, more recent research has called this into question. A lot of the methodology looking at these ovulatory shifts hasn't been able to replicate very well, which seems to be the yep. case with a lot of hormonal research across the board, probably due to methodological differences from, you know, 20 years ago compared to now. And now kind of what seems to have stuck around is like, okay, when there is this shift of fertility, uh, libido is higher, but mate preferences seem to be pretty much the same as far as the good genes traits are concerned, as far as physical attractiveness is concerned, both for short-term 
and long-term mates. So I think that is kind of where things stand right now. Another thing David Buss said in that same article, he said, actually, short-term mating may only apply to kind of a small subset of women. And I think this is important also, is that a lot of what we may have considered short-term mating might actually kind of be a way that people enter long-term relationships. So a lot of the time, if someone will have sex early in a relationship or have a fling or something like that, they may very well want that to continue into a long-term relationship. It may never get off the ground and it may be like, oh, it was kind of a counted as a, you know, a casual sex, but it might not have actually been that way intended from the beginning. What are some misconceptions that people have about what the other sex wants? Uh, and, and I guess we'll start with women here. Like what, if, if anything, what do women generally kind of expect men to desire or think men care about that in practice, they actually don't seem to care about, if anything? Well, I guess a good example of what women think that men may care about that in practice they don't would be cues of of status, like education and resources. Uh, it's very common mm. that you'll see anecdotes in forums, dating spaces online, that women will say, I'm a catch. And then they go off to describe all of these different things, these traits that are typically good traits and that are actually quite impressive. They'll say, I have a PhD. I make a million dollars. You know, I, I, I travel to all of these countries every year. I own my own house and car. And it's like, okay, those are traits that are really attractive uh, when women view a man, right? If women see that in a man, those are status cues and, and income cues that are, are very, very attractive. For men, a lot of the time, those things don't really uh, do very much. They don't really shift the bar because men are so oriented toward appearance, toward physical attractiveness. That doesn't mean that they're not important in dating and mate selection because being high status typically puts you in a pool of, of men that are also higher status. So those do have an indirect effect, but they're not something that men will see on paper and be like, yeah, I really like that woman because she has a, a house and a, and, a, and a good career. That's interesting. I kind of want to, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in a weird pool because obviously, you know, um, I, I'm, you know, in grad school or have been to grad and have been to grad school as well. So I'm, you know, surrounded by super educated men, but I've definitely, I definitely know guys who have you know, broken up with girls because they, I, I, I only know two cases of this happening, but they cited basically, you know, she's not going anywhere. Right. Which I, I can't really imagine like our grandfather's caring about, but I do feel like maybe the modern mating market might be a little more sensitive to, you know, a woman's, a woman's ability to provide resources because, you know, you can't even, you, you, you can't even hope to support a family on one income now. And so I, I would expect that men would be more interested in cues to status and resources in women. And then another thing that, and I'm actually kind of uh, thinking about data that I learned about from you was you did a pretty cool analysis of, um, of some census data where you talked about like education levels in women and their likelihood of being married. And this this was in a group over 28, so it, it was compelling that this isn't just like a masked age effect. And women with PhDs were like almost never not married. And then women with, you know, a, a little bit of grad school or um, or an undergraduate degree were usually married. And then it was women, you know, who never went to college or didn't graduate high school. Those are the ones who were like struggling to get married. What, what Do you think that that's relevant here or do you think that that's caused by other things? I'm actually kind of interested in what you're analysis of that data is in terms of why we see that effect where more educated women seem to have less trouble getting married. Sure, sure. So yeah, and, and I mean, that's kind of related because on paper, if if you put all of these good uh, kind of status cues and things and men will say, you know, that doesn't shift the, the button for me very much. Those are things that maybe men should think about more. And I think if men are perhaps more thoughtful and they're planning long term, they are going to be more likely to think like, ah, maybe this woman isn't going anywhere, especially when you look into statistics kind of like that. Like, okay, so more educated women, yeah, much more likely to be married. And also they're much less likely to get divorced. So you have these two things together, right? Lower likelihood of divorce, higher likelihood of marriage. Why might that be? Well, we might have people that are more stable in their personality, right? We know that Higher education is associated with some personality traits that are also associated with relationship stability, like uh, conscientiousness mm. in the big five. I think agreeableness to a smaller extent. Uh, another uh, relationship could be with, with measured intelligence, right? Individuals that have a higher level of education tend to have a higher IQ on average. And also, that's something that's associated with a lower likelihood of divorce, perhaps better long-term planning in that case. And also, mm. these are people, I think, that are going to be in an environment 
kind of with peers who are of a similar disposition. So you might kind of see a strong effect of, of assortative mating in that sense, where people that are very likely to kind of be stable might end up together in that environment. Wow. Okay. That is a very cool hypothesis. So it's not really that getting more educated as a woman helps you get a mate. It's more that the fact that you are educated tells us so much about your personality and those personality components are what's actually assisting you find a mate. And okay, that's, I I think that, 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 that definitely could be right. Yeah. And there might be some small causal effects as well. For example, we know that financial stress is associated with with divorce, so maybe there's that sort of thing that that could play into it. That would be a causal effect. Okay, more educated people, they're going to be more affluent, so they're not going to have financial stresses that are going to lead to divorce. But yeah, I think most of it, if I were to make a guess, would be basically that education functions kind of to select and sort people by personality traits and by intelligence to some extent. Cool. And then how does this fit in with the idea that women are in some sense, hypergamous, the idea that women are mating up. Because surely, like, let's say women are hypergamous in terms of education, right? Women with PhDs want a guy who's also got a graduate level education um, or more. Um, Women who have undergraduate degrees don't want to date high school graduates and so on and so forth. Shouldn't women who are more educated have, like, less options in that sense? Or, Or are women more relaxed about hypergamy than than we might assume just based on, you know, looking around the world and and what women say they want on paper. I suspect they're a little bit more relaxed than some of the discourse out there would depict. And, you Mm -hmm. know, certainly there's research recently that has indicated, okay, we're seeing a shift away from hypergamous marriages in Europe toward hypogamous marriages. And why is that? Because many more women are entering the university. And and this, this sex difference is really big in some countries in the EU now. And so what can women do if they have to select down? But that does raise a question. There's, you know, the hypergamy that we observe, like, okay, so are women marrying up on average? And then there's a preference for hypergamy, which is, would women prefer to have a man who's higher in status, higher in education, higher in income? And that can be a problem. And that might relate to what's been called the mating crisis. If women are kind of being forced by the environment to select down, but they would prefer a mate who is higher in status or something, will that lead to more relationship on unhappiness. But again, that's again we, that's not something that would be reflected in the divorce statistics either, right? Because the most educated women are also the least likely to get divorced, and the same is true for men. So, yeah. So it seems like they're kind doing of a puzzle. fine in practice. Yeah, they, I think yeah. they're doing fine. I would love your kind of weigh-in on hypergamy and and how women are actually hypergamous, if at all, and this kind of idea that there's there's multiple ways that they can be hyper, hypergamous, like there's multiple ladders on which to mate up. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, yeah, like you said, sometimes the term hypergamy is used to mean a selection up for pretty much anything at all, which is kind of like, okay, I'm attracted to the hottest guy, right? Now, something we do see that's pretty consistent for both men and women is that they show preferences basically for the most attractive mate, potential mate of the opposite sex. That's something that you see in dating app research and all of that, that, you know, the most attractive photos get swiped on the most by the opposite sex, men or women or whatever. So in that case, you would say, okay, both men and women make hypergamous selections for physical attractiveness. If we call, if we want to call that hypergamy, then that's something that we see. And, and, you know, again, it's something that men prioritize more. So in that sense, men would even be more hypergamous if we talk about physical attractiveness, but you know, we see it in both people. Yeah. They have a very strong preference for more attractive individuals. Then we have all of the other things, right? Income, education, other status cues that occur alongside that. So sometimes people will focus on one and kind of ignore the others, because if we do have all of these different things, then you can have a mismatch, right? You could have someone who is much lower in status, but who is more attractive. And then would you characterize something like that as a hypergamous selection or a hypogamous selection, right? They're more attractive, so it's hypergamous, but at the same time, they've selected way down in status and all of these other things. So yep. what would you really categorize that as? I, you know, it's whatever you want it to be. And that's kind of the way that the people use the term is, you know, kind of they make it whatever they want it to be in the moment. Yeah. And that flexibility of terms is really what allows people in kind of a non-scientific mindset to always be right, right? Because there's, there's no, there's no opportunity to be disproven if every time, you know, there's, there's evidence against you, you just kind of change your definition slightly. It, it, make, it makes things very, um, very squirrely. 
Yeah, exactly. And certainly something people do a lot also is they they kind of use hypergamy as synonymous with promiscuity. So if someone cheats, for example, they say that's hypergamous. But do we know if the person that they cheated with is higher status? Is it really someone that's more attractive? Is it someone that's actually on the same level, in which case you'd say, say it was more assortative or something like that? Or if someone is just having casual sex, they'll say it's hypergamy. It, but it might be, you know, individuals at a much lower status, which is kind of consistent with the research that, you know, you do see a little bit more promiscuity and lower socioeconomic status as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of questions around that as, as to the way that it's used out there. Yeah, I mean, we've got one of the best data sets on infidelity out there. and. When you look at it, there definitely are cases where women are mating with guys who, at least according to them, are just worse in basically every way. And then when you look at their the kind of qualitative data associated with their response, oftentimes their motivations for affairs are, you know, they want to end their own relationship. That that's that's one potential motivation. It's like, hey, I actually just want this relationship to be over, and so I'm going to cheat to end it. Um, kind of a walk away strategy, as David Buss would call it. That's comparing it to something we see in evolutionary biology. And then there's also um, cases where, you know, women are cheating to get revenge, either for their partner's transgressions in their own infidelity or their partner's transgressions just in general, right? Like he hasn't been doing the things that I expect of him. He hasn't been living up to his end of the contract. So I'm going to violate my side of the relationship contract as hard as possible um, to really punish that. So I, so I think you're definitely right that the kind of view where the kind of view of women's infidelity that's been tossed around the internet of like, it's always, you know, the somehow better guy um, interloping. That's, that's definitely not true. At least it's not true in every case, even if it might be true in most cases. Yeah. And what you described there is interesting also, because that shows there's a bunch of different motivations for infidelity. And, and in, in common dating discourse, people just focus on a very narrow set of variables. It's like, oh, they were more, they were hotter or something like that, or they were richer. And it's like, no, people, you know, they cheat for strange reasons like revenge and that sort of thing that you described. Exactly. And this is, this is what we see in our data set. And, and even theoretically, I mean, over the years, the infidelity discourse in academia has been really generative, not so much for men's infidelity, men's infidelity. It's been like, oh, men want sexual variety. And, um, and so they want more mates, right? There's an evolved desire for sexual variety because more mates for mammals generally means more offspring. And there's this desire that even in an environment where we now have contraception, the desire still persists and it motivates infidelity. But even with men's infidelity, right, we, we see multiple motives. And, and, I, and what I was saying a second ago was just that the reason it's been such a generative discussion in academia where it's like, oh, women cheat because X, women cheat because Y, women cheat because Z is because individual women do cheat for X, Y, and Z, right? There are actually multiple reasons why women cheat. And so different hypotheses can get support in different circumstances. Um, I, you know, we talked about revenge, mate switching is another one, uh, causing a breakup is another one, obtaining genetic benefits from an extra partner is another one. Um, but even uh, like... Among the Himba, for example, it seems that most infidelity is just to obtain more resources, right? It's like boyfriends give you stuff. And so if you have multiple boyfriends, you get more stuff. And that happens in the West as well. We see, you know, women cheat with essentially sugar daddies and things like that, where they're obtaining an additional investor in them. Um, they're getting more boyfriends, essentially. I guess uh, another end of this that I, uh, I want to discuss, though, is what men get wrong. So we, we, we started this kind of tangent with with the question what do women misperceive about what men want what do men generally get wrong about what women want i think a big one is that men often kind of well and I, this goes both ways kind of what i described before but men often interpret that female desire and behavior is going to be similar to male desire and behavior particularly on a sexual level that women are seeking sex to the same extent that men are for example, you'll see this a lot in discourse around dating apps that uh, essentially like, oh, if I were a woman, then I could go on the dating app and I could have a thousand matches. And the idea being that you're going to have like a thousand desirable guys or something at your fingertips. But that's typically not the way that women perceive it. Women can go on the app, have a bunch of matches and not like any of those people, go on dates and not want to have sex with any of those people. Whereas if a man was put in that position, you know, it might be that kind of harem fantasy uh, come to life in that sense. And so certainly, you know, this is related to large sex differences in 
sociosexuality, you know, the willingness to have se casual sex, the willingness to have sex with multiple partners. I don't think men often understand how different men and women are on that uh, level. Well, well, how different, how different are they? Well, if you look at the difference between sociosexuality between men and women, it's about a standard deviation. So, uh, you know, Cohen's D of about, of about 0.9 to 0.1. So that's pretty oh, large wow. for, for psychology. To give a reference, you know, an average would be about 0.3. So it's kind of uncommon to see, you know, single variable personality differences that large. And how does that transpire, you know, it's kind of an abstract measure. If I say Cohen's D of 0.9, what does that really mean? We could look at kind of actual behaviors, like how does that uh, translate into actual behavior? A good example of this would be the classic research of Clark and Hatfield. And this is something that's been done different ways, kind of replicated. But they sent men and women to a university campus, uh, you know, what they called at the time, kind of experiment experimenters participating. They called them confederates at the time where men and women of different levels of attractiveness would go up to strangers, and then they would say, you want to go on a date with me? You want to have sex with me? That sort of a thing. So an attractive woman that approaches men on campus and just says, hey, do you want to have sex with me? A lot of men will say yes. If an attractive man approaches women on campus and says that, none of the women said yes. Hmm. And, and so that's kind of the difference in sociosexuality that you see, is that there are a lot of men who will just flat out agree on the spot to having sex with a complete stranger Women, pretty much none, none of the time, regardless of how attractive the man is. Do you think that we could get those numbers closer, though, if we did it in a setting where that would be less scary? Like, because it's such a social violation and because men can be so dangerous, I feel like that might be part of the reason why those results show such a sex difference. Like, surely, if we went to, like, the most fun college nightclub in town and had a, a, you know, a really attractive guy going up to women, he would have a higher success rate or maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I guess I, I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts as to how much of that is just that it's such a norm violation and norm violating men are so scary. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think that's a big part of it actually. Yeah. It's because certainly men pose a threat to women in that sense on a physical level, right? That can cause physical harm to women. There's a huge difference in in physical strength, and then even from the evolutionary point of view, right, that women have to be much more selective with their partners. Uh, you know, a man can hypothetically have many partners and has no burden of, of caring for the offspring. Not the case with a woman who has to carry a child in, in her body. She has that physical burden, then the burden of reproduction. So women have probably evolved to be much more selective. Now, there, there actually has been some uh, kind of a replication of that Clark and Hatfield that's, that asked that question that said, okay, could we kind of narrow this gap? And I think one of the things they did was they said, imagine your most attractive friend, your most attractive male friend. Mm. And if women imagine their most attractive male friend just kind of proposing casual sex like that, yeah, then it wasn't zero. Then more of them said yes. So there is kind of a difference there, you know, and, and it's not exactly the same situation because it's not like a complete stranger, but yeah. it is kind of like, okay, this is someone that they already view as attractive and that they're kind of comfortable with. And, you know, if you can get past that comfort thing, yeah, then then more women will agree to, to casual sex in that sense. I wonder how much of that is that the raw physique of a man actually isn't doing as much work as the kind of raw physical traits of a woman do. Yeah, like you said, a lot of the traits that make men attractive to women are kind of hidden. And, and there's a lot of people out there that, that don't believe that, that kind of think everything is all looks. But no, there's a, there's a big difference in what a woman might find attractive in a man when she views him just based on his looks and then when she gets to know him a little bit. And there's been recent research that has looked at uh, differences in kind of assortative mating for attractiveness depending on how long the couple knew each other before they got together. And they say, okay, there's a greater difference in physical attractiveness between couples who knew each other for a longer period of time. Why might that be? Well, probably, you know, you have basically what it's saying is there's one that's much more attractive than the other. How did they get together? Well, they knew each other a long time. They started liking each other for some other reason. So cool. That's a very cool result. You have to <coughs> send me that after. Um, speaking of just results, uh, you've been, you've been running some pretty fun. I mean, uh, Twitter has become a bit of a intellectual playground for you, where you're, you know, exploring a lot of ideas, doing these long research threads, but you've also been doing research with Twitter. I guess I'd just ask you to kind of audit your own research. How do you think it compares? Um, obviously, you know, the data analysis and and basic methods are going to be similar standard, but the recruitment, how, how much do you think that actually interferes with the generalizability of your results? The fact that it's, you know, mostly followers of at date psych on Twitter? Well, 
It's hard, it's hard to know how many are just my followers because they often get retweeted so much that it's probably wanders into some others. But yeah, but it's, it's a Twitter sample. So that does raise the question, right? Like how generalizable is this Twitter sample going to be? And, and specifically, how generalizable is it going to be? Because it's people that like most of them that respond, yeah, probably are people who follow me specifically. So if, if I were to kind of audit the research and say, what kind of things have we seen replicated? So one of those would be actually the sex difference in sociosexuality in a more recent one. And I didn't use a, a validated sociosexuality scale. I simply asked a question. I said, how open are you to casual sex? Which is kind of like one of the items on those. But I still got a, a sex difference uh, the same direction where men were much more open to casual sex and the effect size, the same magnitude, about 0. 0.8. Hmm. And let's see. So another one that I ran, I used photographs from the reading the mind in the eyes test, which is an assessment for autism. And I recruited participants. I asked who of them were members of incel communities who might be involuntarily celibate, that sort of a thing. The idea is that incels typically reported higher rates of autism, that self reports, right? Yes. In past research, they said, okay, yeah, a lot of us are autistic. So I hypothesized, well, you know, could we see if, if individuals who identify as this might actually score higher on that test. Uh, a small result there, not a super strong result, but little things like that. You know, I, There's always the question with something like Twitter, like how generalizable is this going to be? That's certainly a limitation that applies to most of the samples we use in psychology, right? A lot which are taken from a university or which could be taken from an online platform like, uh, like MTurk or something like that. Yeah, it w it'll be cool if ultimately, it it's good to hear that those replicated and it'll be really cool to see if eventually, you know, someone actually does the study where it's like, OK, comparing a Twitter sample with an MTurk sample, which is obviously quite credible at this point, um, more credible than most undergraduate samples, it seems. And a or more more generalizable is what I'm saying. Credible is kind of a, a bit too cheeky of a term. And, you know, prolific academic and, and these other online samples, maybe Twitter isn't that bad. I mean, if that if that proves to be the case, then um, suddenly Ayala or Ayala or whatever, however you pronounce her name is going to be one of the most, you know, important contributors to psychology of the last five years. Um, but anyway, because um, she's obviously done for those who don't know, it's, it's she's an online figure who's been doing these um, Twitter studies for quite a while now. Right. Am I am I correct in that? Oh, I, I imagine she's been doing this for a very long time, longer than I've been on Twitter for that. So certainly one thing she did recently was she asked about infidelity and she found that men cheated, you know, about, I think about 50% to twice as much as, as women, which is, you know, kind of just a standard. That's about right. Yeah, it's just a standard observation. Another thing that's very, very well replicated across evolutionary psychology, other fields of psychology is that men cheat more. So yeah, t things like that that you would expect to see, I imagine, get replicated pretty well from a Twitter sample. Super cool. I guess, um, are there any particularly interesting results from your um, Twitter studies? One, one that I really liked was actually the GigaChad study because I thought that it really illustrated um, a kind of failure of the imagination by men. So men often seem to think that scary traits are sexy, uh, I've noticed. Like men tend to want to be more muscular than women want them to be. Uh, men tend to think that deep voices are more attractive than women think they are. Um, men tend to think that beards and facial hair are more attractive than women think they are. I mean, I'm not saying that women don't find all three of the things I mentioned attractive, uh, but it was cool to see in the GigaChad study that massive result where it was like, um, I guess, I guess I'll let you explain it because, uh, because some of my audience won't even know who, who this mythical GigaChad is, but it was, it was a funny study, but also a really interesting one. Yeah. Well, if anyone doesn't know who GigaChad is, yeah, look up GigaChad. You'll see the picture. It's a, a man who has a very sexually dimorphic face, an extremely masculine face, large jaw and everything. And he's been turned into a meme called the Giga Chad. So I took a photograph of his face and I asked men, this was the only question. I asked men and women to rate this on a, you know, a one to seven Likert scale. Men overwhelmingly rated him as attractive, well above average. Women rated him below average. And of course, some women rated him attractive and some men didn't, but you know, on average, so we, yeah, we see a sex difference here in that men thought that the Giga Chad was very attractive, but women didn't. And that's actually something that's very consistent with, with past research on facial attractiveness as well, is that the most sexually dimorphic male faces are not perceived as the most attractive to women. Faces that yes. typically reside a little bit masculine, but kind of close to average, seem to be the most attractive. And what we have in the Giga Chad is someone that has a very extremely dimorphic face. But men do rate more dimorphic male faces is more attractive. In particular, uh, gay men even more rate 
Oh, wow. Dimorphic male faces is more attractive. All of that's actually in the article, kind of that, that past research. So what's probably happening is we do see an overlap between cues that men find, uh, like status cues, leadership cues, and cues of uh, kind of physical threat that are sometimes seen as, like I said, like status symbols to men, but then attractive to women. And I think maybe that's kind of that failure there of, of kind of seeing what the opposite sex wants, is that men say, okay, this is someone I would like to look like. This is someone that's very intimidating. You know, he's, he's very handsome to me, you know, thinking that as a man. And then they think, okay, so that's probably what women would like. But no, no, yeah. that's, yeah, difference there. That's funny. We, we, we see the same thing in tattoo research, actually. So I, I, I don't know if you know this, but I'm actually, I'm completely covered in tattoos. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, <laughs> fun fact, um, usually hidden. Um, but one thing that's, that's quite interesting is that they've done large studies now. Uh, we're talking like 2000 people and they've, you know, they've made an effort to get a good sample. Like they've been like stopping in different towns and flagging down people in person and like really uh, interviewing them, um, doing these studies where they have really well photoshopped images where they've added tattoos to shirtless men who don't have them. Right. Um, and I think maybe removed tattoos from shirtless men who do have them and basically had women rate the attractive men and women rate the attractiveness of these, um, individuals and rate them on a whole bunch of things. Like, you know, how reliable do you think this person is? How dominant do you think they are? How healthy do you think they're likely to be? And it's a super cool effect. Cause what, cause what we see is that, um, women on average don't seem to prefer men with tattoos. Um, they also don't seem to be discriminating against them. Um, but men look at men with tattoos and think, yeah, that's, that's a hotter guy, which is kind of hilarious. So the, the, and gay men didn't prefer tattoos either. So the only group that thought that men look better with tattoos uh, were heterosexual men. So the only group that's not making mating decisions with regards to males um, is the only group that thinks they're sexy, which is kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? There was something else kind of similar to this. Uh, I just did a Twitter poll on this. I didn't even do a survey off the website, but I got a lot of responses. I put up a picture of Brad Pitt from Fight Club and a picture of Robin Hood from the Disney's Robin Hood, the animated oh, yes, Fox. Yeah. And I said, which would you prefer to date? And the women overwhelmingly picked Robin Hood. And a lot of guys, they left comments and they got really mad. They're like, you really believe the women would pick Robin Hood? Look at how sexy Brad Pitt is. And it's like, okay, but you guys know that like Robin Hood was like a lot of these girls, like first crush, that he's like a hero in a story. He has yeah. like all of the traits that women find attractive, uh, even though he's an animated character. And then like yeah. Brad Pitt has a nice body and that's it. So who did the women pick? Yeah, right. It, it's, it's funny that... Um you're creating a bit of an internet culture around your Twitter, which is, which is really unusual for a science communicator. It's one of the reasons that you're my favorite science communicator is just that like, it's, it's very, you know, modern. Like there's a lot of like date psych inside jokes that are just kind of memes. Um, and my favorite is definitely the, um, ascending the status hierarchy by, um, ascending into the treetops. I, I think that that's, uh, you know, lives in trees <laughs> is a cool one. Yeah. Um, anyway, another thing that you're really known for online is being a bit of a fact checker of online dating nonsense. Uh, and, and I don't actually mean online dating nonsense. I mean, dating nonsense that is circulating online. And I think it's fair to say that in the current meta, that mostly involves fact checking the manosphere um, or the red pill movement. Although I've seen you, you know, um, you're, you definitely will talk about all errors so you know more about this group than me, that these, these manif Manosphere blokes, who are these guys? What is the Manosphere? Uh, what would you say their general core beliefs are? What, what's going on uh, with these folks? Okay, sure. So the Manosphere is, it's really a very broad kind of umbrella term that refers to a bunch of different subgroups within it, right? But it's essentially the whole online community of men that talk about men's issues. And this can range from like I said, it's it's very uh, heterogeneous, right? It's not a homogenous uh, movement or group at all. It's a very broad descriptor. So you have men that are like into self-improvement. You have men that are kind of like maybe traditional conservatives a little bit that want kind of, you know, kind of traditional roles. You have what's called the red pill, which is kind of uh, derived from what used to be kind of pickup artistry, seduction communities, but now the red pill is kind of shifted away from that. You have what's called MGTOW, which is men going their own way. These are men that have kind of sworn off women and dating. Certainly they don't want to get married. You have other communities called the Black Pill. These are individuals that believe that looks are the most important thing. A lot of them have believed that they can't succeed in dating because they're not 
sufficiently attractive. These are just like really rough descriptors of all of these. I'm sure people are going to hear that and be like, no, that's completely wrong. But just kind of going, <laughs> going, because <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. They, they, yeah. it's so, it's so different what people in these groups believe so many different things that, you know, you can describe it and they'll say, no, that's completely wrong. But so these are different groups. A lot of them are focused on dating, you know, so particularly that's kind of what I get into. A lot of them are focused on dating and attractiveness, you know, what's going to make relationships work, how are you going to attract women, all of that sort of thing. Interesting. So you would say that the unifying feature is that they're focused on men. They, they tend to be more conservative um, and they're interested in they have a they have a special interest in dating and women. What do they have any unifying beliefs? I know that, the, you know, the difference between an incel and a pickup artist and, you know, an, an MG tower, whatever that was, that, that, that there's going to be, you know, divides there. But do they have anything in common that they all kind of could sit down and agree on? You know, if I try to think about like one unifying belief across the whole manosphere, even that would be difficult because some of these communities are very opposed to one another. You know, certainly incels, for example, they really dislike pickup artists. You know, these are two communities. But what they might agree upon, I think there are common memes that many of them would agree upon are perhaps elements of, of what they would describe as as female nature. If you were to say, you know, women are hypergamous, I think that's something that you would find very high agreement on. They might not even agree on like what it means for women to be hypergamous. But they would the agree with that statement. But they would probably yeah. agree with that statement. And interestingly, I don't have the data up on this on the website, but I made a scale, kind of a red black pill scale, that actually categorized these beliefs. I'll, I'll send that to you when we're finished, I think. Yeah, please. But yeah, a lot of things that kind of overlap, certainly the black pillars would believe that physical attractiveness is very important. Red pillars might believe that physical attractiveness is important, but also that status is important and that sort of a thing. Interesting. So I, I think we're going to say some really, I guess, I guess we'll kind of zero in on the red pill because I think that's the group that I've seen you interact with the most. I, although lately it's been more incels, but I, but I think the red pill is the group that's really been six has good PR lately, right? They, they had, um, they, they've got these fresh and fit guys. They're going viral on TikTok a lot. They're going viral on all social media a lot. Um, and they're basically, you know, these are the guys who are talking about female hypergamy. Sure. Um, they're also talking about, um, you know, body count being, you know, a huge factor in women's dating success. Uh, these guys are talking about, uh, the wall, uh, this concept that like women age poorly, and then kind of the counter concept that women, uh, that men actually, you know, they, men hit their, their reproductive peak in like their mid forties or something, <laughs> um, which, you know, is a bit, is a bit, uh, is a bit crazy, um, in my opinion. Uh, so they, they've got this kind of constellation of beliefs that, uh, that we would variously, you know, critique, but I guess since we're probably going to do some criticizing here, wh- what do you actually agree with them on? Like, do, do, do these red pill guys, because they give a lot of like dating advice and things like that. Uh, and they also have a lot of commentary on like the Ev psych literature. Like they actually, you know, they, they're citing studies on their podcast, sometimes erroneously. What would you say we would agree or you would agree with them on? Yeah, that's a good place to start. Because like you said, sometimes, yeah, they kind of interpret me as like this debunker or something, but I I try not to be too hostile to to these groups because, you know, there's always a nucleus of truth in in all of these things. It's really rare that people get everything wrong. Something I think that a lot of people in the manosphere across all of these different communities would agree with as far as advice for men is kind of like lifting, uh, bodybuilding, getting strong and all of that. And, And certainly that's something, you know, that if you do it for yourself because it's good for you, okay, that's good. But there's also a lot of research that indicates, okay, so yeah, Having, you know, a muscular body, not necessarily like bodybuilder on stage muscular, but well above what the average man may be, is going to be more attractive to women. So that's typically advice I think many people in that space would agree on that's not going to even be controversial outside of it. A lot yeah. of, you know, the, the topics that uh, enter from evolutionary psychology, it's interesting because they have kind of brought those topics into uh, popular discourse. And, and while they don't always get them very right in a technical sense, it is kind of neat that they've brought them into discussion. Ideas like hypergamy, okay? Ideas that physical attractiveness matters, right? Because what they would call, you know, there's people that say physical attractiveness doesn't matter at all. It's all, and and that's something that the red pill or the manosphere would call blue-pilled, right? But that's probably something that they're right about because physical attractiveness does very often emerge as a very important variable in mate selection, even in long-term relationship satisfaction. There's studies that indicate 
uh, women have more orgasms with their partners when their partner is more physically attractive. So telling people, you know, that like looks don't matter at all might have been a bit of a disservice to people at some point. Yeah. And similarly, the kind of dating advice that a lot of people will hear and a lot of people will say just because it sounds friendly is the whole like, oh, just be yourself. I, I think that's true for some psychological characteristics. Like, I don't think putting on a new personality uh, for attracting mates is, you know, that's, I mean, that, that, that that's probably, you probably just can't keep it up uh, regardless of whether it could work. But, you know, the whole just be yourself dating advice that a lot of people, a lot of children will have heard um, growing up, a lot of adolescents will have gotten um, from, you know, kind relatives and things like that. It's it's sure maybe be yourself, but the whole like just be yourself side of it is is wrong. Like you do need to put in mating effort. Um, people expect you to bring something to the table, and that's another thing that's really interesting about the red pill that you actually pointed out to me is just that a lot of them seem seem to have like just it's it's it's, it's as if they swallowed the blue pill, just hook line and sinker, and then were heartbroken to discover like oh actually you know. Um, women do care if I don't have a job, right? Like that, like, or like, you know, women do care that, um, I dropped out of high school. Like they're, they're just completely devastated by the knowledge that like women actually don't love you for you. They love you for the many things you bring to the table, such as your looks, such as, you know, the kind elements of your personality, although they probably wouldn't agree with that. Um, yeah, anyway. Yeah, exactly. Certain, you know, and certainly when I do offer critiques of the manosphere, which are often pretty focused on something specifically, and usually I don't think they're especially ideological, but people will call me, you know, they'll say, oh, very blue pill, blue pill take. But like you said, it seems to me that a lot of these men may have actually kind of internalized these, these popular myths. You know, I call them a part of our, of our folk psychology, these very, very popular dating myths that uh, you know, like as long as you're a good person on the inside, people are going to like you. Your physical attractiveness doesn't matter. A very, very idealistic, almost Disney-like view of dating. And that's not something that I ever grew up with or that I had. You know, I was taught from a pretty young age and even just observing the world around me. But, you know, I was taught, you know, like you got to go to school. You got to you got to make some money. You got to, you know, look good or, or women aren't going to like you, you know, those sorts of things. And if you look around at the world, I think that seems pretty obvious as well. You know, people that are more physically attractive get elevated, you know, to positions where they're put front and center, so to speak. How did they come to form those beliefs? I'm not in, entirely sure, but I can see why they have so much resentment. You know, they, they call it blue pill and red pill from the matrix. And the idea is like, oh, I was blue pilled and I took the red pill and now I'm awake. And, and a lot of the time they have a lot of resentment from that because it's kind of like, oh, these things I used to believe turned out not to be true. Yeah, exactly. That's so well put. And it's funny because it, it's almost like they didn't quite they didn't quite read between the lines growing up, maybe, where it's like, yeah, I also grew up in the messaging of like, you know, Disney movies where it's, you know, the beauty falls in love with the beast, right? Like that kind of thing. Um, but in the real world, I don't think I ever bit down on that too hard. Like, I think I always understood. Yeah. yeah like if you want to, you know, in like in high school, it's like, yeah, if you want girls to like you, you better, you know, be good at sports and start competing in something and winning in it. Um, and you, it would be better if you looked handsome while doing it. And then, you know, as an adult, it's like, gosh, I really got to make sure that my, my bank account's straight and that I can actually pay for the date at the end of it. I don't know. It, it, it's weird how many of these guys seem to have brought nothing but the quirks of their personality to the table and then been disappointed when that's not enough. I, I, you had an awesome thread recently where you just pointed out that some of the things that guys thought made them worthy of dating. I, I think, I think it was crying over bugs, um, crying over killing insects or something. It was just a couple things where it was like very internal, basically like having feelings and expecting that that would have girls running towards them. Um, and also the fact that women weren't running towards them for those traits was somehow proof that women don't like nice guys. And actually, this is also why I was interested in, in what's called theory of mind. I mentioned before the reading the mind in the eyes test and the incel subculture. So many of these individuals report uh, difficulties with autism. And that is described mm. as kind of, you know, by, by, the, uh, by the neuropsychologist uh, Baron Cohen, he described theory of mind deficits as the core deficit of autism. And so these theory of mind deficits, what they basically result in, in a practical sense, is kind of the inability to pick up on like really subtle social cues. And so I wonder if it's the case, you know, that we, we see, you know, higher rates of autism in some of these communities. And maybe that is why they've had some difficulty integrating 
uh, nuance and complexity of human behavior and what is attractive. Like, okay, you know, being pro-social is attractive, but women also like a bad boy. How do we reconcile those two things? You know, for me, it's not super difficult kind of to hold those two ideas and reconcile. But for some people, and particularly, I think, maybe individuals that might have uh, autism spectrum disorder, that might be something that's like a real mental kind of cognitive conflict for them. Yeah. Yes, that that's that's well said. I guess we'll just kind of do a little pit stop here and talk about bad boys for a second, because uh, you've had some of the more interesting nuanced takes on this. Um, do women like bad boys or, or what, what, what are women actually liking about bad boys and what, what, what makes a bad boy sexy? I guess, I guess what's, what's the whole, there's obviously the stereotype that like, oh, women love a bad boy, but what, what's the, what's the actual, where, where does the rubber meet the road on that point? Sure. So I think, I think it is fair to say on average that women do like bad boys. Uh, I think what people get very wrong often is what they categorize as a bad boy, because you'll often see people turn around and say, women love criminals. Or you know, you'll even say men, uh, people say like women love serial killers and you have like a, a very, you know, a minute and a very tiny group of people that have like serial killer fetish, right? Habristophilia. If that yeah. even, yeah, and there's even debate on if that's even real, but certainly you do see communities of, of women that are like obsessed with that, but they're so incredibly small. Yet this attraction to bad boys is not something that's small. That is something that, that is pretty pervasive. And, and you can see this, for example, in erotic literature. This is something that I'm kind of working on now, another, another side project. If you look at many of the bestsellers at the moment of erotic literature, the individuals that feature in those, the main male protagonist is kind of like mafia boss, you know, or, or, or some other kind of bad boy. Maybe it's like a vampire or a werewolf in some yeah. cases, you know, but they are kind of bad boys. And then we have research on, at the same time, on the dark triad, right, which is kind of a subclinical construct, a personality construct that's associated kind of with that bad boy behavior. So yeah, there is kind of this broad idea that women like bad boys, but then at the same time, we have a lot of research that indicate women prefer pro-social behavior, right? Kindness, uh, loyalty, trustworthiness. And this is also very, very robust, this literature as well. So it's kind of like, how do we reconcile these two? Well, how do we? I mean, I, I saw one uh, one thread from you where you talked about the narcissism research, where it's like when you actually drill down in like a speed dating study and separate out the dark triad well like you have your study design so you're not so you're actually kind of decorrelating the dark triad so you can actually see what's causing the effect it's just narcissism right it's like the narcissistic guys are sexy and that kind of makes sense because you know narcissism controls for at least projected insecurity right like those those guys aren't going to be the ones who are oh you know you probably wouldn't want to go on another date with me like that kind of thing which mm -hmm. is obviously a bit of an egg um and then they're also going to be you know pretty hygienic generally they're going to be well groomed like narcissists are generally better looking so so i, I guess what what is it what is it about the bad thing that's actually like because i because i don't get the impression regardless of what the red pill maniacs um are saying about you know women loving criminals I very much get the impression that if a guy was acting like a malignant psychopath um, or a, a, like a Machiavellian just worm just constantly snaking people, that that would not be what makes women interested. But maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe that maybe there is data there. No, that's exactly right what you're saying. So certainly, yeah, let's take an example from kind of the criminal behavior. When women say or when you read these erotic novels, or when people say, you know, women love criminals, it's never like a guy who's like smoking meth, right? It's not like someone who's forging <laughs> checks, right? It's like the mafia boss. So it's so not So he's just very like, high status and cool. Ex exactly, yeah. yeah. It's not antisocial behavior across the board or criminal behavior across the board. It's very, very specific behaviors. And those are behaviors that usually indicate some kind of competence. This is something that uh, Jordan Peterson and David Buss, they had a recent discussion on this, and they were saying, okay, maybe the dark triad, why it is attractive is because it mimics competence. It mimics certain pro-social behaviors, and that would be consistent with the research kind of decoupling narcissism from the psychopathy and Machiavellianism in the dark triad, because narcissists are really good at mimicking competence, and they can keep it up for a little bit, and they also take care of their physical appearance more, right? They might even be perceived as more physically attractive kind of because they're taking better care of themselves. And then there was another recent study that basically found the exact same thing that said, okay, these are individuals that are rated kind of higher in competence. So why might th this bad boy behavior uh, or, you know, that sort of a thing 
be perceived as more attractive? Probably because it's the elements associated with it that kind of mimic, uh, you know, competence, leadership, pro-social behavior. Uh, they mimic extroversion to some sense. So basically, all of the traits associated with why is a bad boy attractive are probably mostly actually the good traits associated with being a bad boy, mm. not like the degenerate, so to speak, kind of traits. The mimicry version of that is, isn't what I've heard before. That's that's very interesting, is that it's kind of a deceptive signal. Uh, one thing that I found very persuasive that that's kind of held true to real life is when you look at the men who are bad boys, who are attractive with women, they would be attractive whether they were bad or not, and maybe would be attractive if more attractive if they were good, right? Like you think about, um, for example, the hot felon guy who's, you know, been thrown around the internet for a few years now. That guy would also be hot if he wasn't a criminal and worked at a gas station. Um, and he might even be hotter if he was, you know, an incredibly philanthropic um, volunteer fireman who also ran a successful business or whatever, right? Like, like it kind of feels like you're, if you controlled for the positive traits they have, such as being handsome, athletic, um, confident, that maybe it, maybe they wouldn't even, maybe the badness would kind of not even show up as an effect. And it's just like, yeah, bad boys happen to have a lot of other things going for them that kind of lets them get away with being bad, but the badness is not, I don't know. What do you, what do you make of that hypothesis? Yeah. I mean, certainly in the case of, you know, Jeremy, Jeremy Meeks, right? The, the hot fellow. Is that the, yeah. this, is, this is someone that is, you know, a male model now. He was picked out of a mugshot lineup because his face was so different and, and uh, tr attractive that, you know, that's going to stand out regardless of his behavior. Would he be more attractive if he had better behavior? Probably. And this is also someone, you know, that has, uh, as far, you know, I don't know that much about him, but I've heard, you know, that he is divorced and that sort of thing. So that also kind of goes to show that, you know, even high physical attractiveness doesn't guarantee that someone is going to have a good relationship. And a lot of people don't look past that in a lot of these online discourses because it's a lot, a lot of the time it's men who have really struggled their whole lives to even attract a woman to ever have a relationship so of course they're really focused on like how do I get the woman but what they don't realize is like okay so you know you have a benefit you know there's definitely a benefit there if you are more physically attractive you can get into a relationship but that's when we begin to see kind of like these bad boy behaviors as destructive right because the same traits predict poorer relationship outcomes they predict you know dark triad predicts divorce predicts infidelity, uh, you know, having children out of, out of a relationship and all sorts of things like that, lower income. So these are things that have bad, you know, they might be associated with initial attraction, but once you get into a relationship, yeah, they're not, not as helpful at that point. Hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. You don't hear a lot of the Manosphere guys talking about like, you know, how to keep your girlfriend like that. it's 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 always like the initial it's casual relationships and then initial attraction and then that probably does just reflect that you know even the more famous guys it's like do, do uh, any of them i mean some i i know that i think that rollo tomasi is married but other than him i don't know any of them that has like a prominent girlfriend um yeah i mean maybe i'm speaking out of school here but it does seem like you know, for all their talk about relationship advice, I don't see any of them with good relationships. Yeah, I was thinking the exact same. I was thinking a lot about this today, actually, the exact same thing. I was thinking, man, I've spent the last year talking about attractiveness and all of this, but it's always in the very initial stages. There's very little discussion at all in these spaces about, yeah, like, how do you have a good relationship? And a lot of the time when I make threads on that or something, the people that respond to it are like entirely different than the yep. people that are interested in like the attractiveness ones. And I realized like, oh yeah, a lot of these people have never gotten to that point. And so perhaps they're not thinking that far ahead to, to value those things or to have learned from experience that like, okay, yeah, maybe you can get a lot of dates, but it really makes a difference uh, once you've kind of had some relationship experience under your belt, like the quality of those relationships. Are you selecting like a good person? Are you able to spot like the problems and, and that sort of a thing? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm an evolutionary scientist. So for me, the rubber doesn't meet the road until there's actual reproduction. <laughs> and if you look at reproductive human relationships, it's very unlikely that a short term, you know, sexual fling is going to lead to pregnancy in a woman. And it's also not like that behavior is super common, um, just like across women as a population, um, or certainly in like non contraceptive uh, populations. So like this whole like, casual sex or sex for fun atmosphere that's not really 
the norm reproductively. The the norm is very much, you know, these long-term pair bonds where after sleeping with the same person throughout their cycle um, over the course of a year, maybe it results in pregnancy, like some 85% of the time. But of course, timing mating well is a, is a bit of a new thing. So th- it just this is all just to say that if we're talking about who's leaving copies of their genes in the next generation, it's not necessarily the sexy psychopath who is successful at obtaining one night stands. It's much more likely to be the guy who, you know, um, girls want to spend years and years sharing a home with. Yeah. And, and, you know, that might be the thing with psychopathy that it, uh, you know, that it's not super common in humans, but that it's persisted because it does confer enough of an advantage, at least for some people in some situations that they're able to kind of continue, right? And, and there has been some interesting research that indicates that with the growth of cities, this may have increased to some extent, right? Because cities let you be very, very anonymous. So they might be an environment that is like better than the small town for a psychopath. But that's kind of a, yeah. a, a detraction there. Yeah, so uh, a lot of people, yeah, they're not thinking about also the environment for, for the child at that point. You know, like, can someone reproduce and, you know, okay, now you have a baby. But... You know, the outcome uh, for that person's future is going to be very, very different if you can have like a stable relationship versus if it's an absent father. So the manosphere seems to have a very strong fixation on women's purity, um, or that that's probably the term that they would use, uh, while simultaneously promoting or endorsing men's promiscuity. Uh, to me, it almost seems like... Uh, as if selfishly pro-male mating interests were just turned into an ideology and put forward as like a moral issue or a moral belief system. Um, and the main area that this comes to the fore is in body count discussions. Uh, there's this idea in the manosphere that, you know, if a woman sleeps with too many guys, then it disrupts pair bonding or, or it makes her more likely to cheat um, or it just makes her somehow tainted in a way that like she can't be in a long-term relationship. But then when men sleep with many women, that actually makes them more attractive to more women. And I, I, I guess I'd just like you to weigh in, like what, what's actually going on there first? What are, the, what are they actually saying? Um, why do you think they're saying it? And then is there any truth to that? What's, what's going on? Oh, sure. So there's a few converging topics here. So let's talk about the pair bonding first. Yeah. So that's something that was created as a meme very, very early in, in the manosphere, the idea that having multiple sexual partners will impact someone's ability to pair bond. I think part of the basis for that was research on prairie voles, where, you know, if you could alter the, uh, the brain of the prairie vole, some, you know, this is an animal that mates for life, to give some background. If you could, you know, kind of alter the brain chemistry of some of them in an experimental condition, we see that they don't mate for life. And this is usually involving oxytocin and vasopressin. Then you have... Uh, related to that meme, the observation that individuals with more sexual partners uh, typically get divorced, that, you know, they have a higher divorce rate on average. If you look at individuals that have had zero or, or one sexual partner at marriage, they divorce much less. And so this turned into this meme that's like, okay, if someone has sex a bunch of times, it, it damages their ability to pair bond, which they say specifically about women for some reason. And they say, you know, oxytocin, vasopressin, all of that. There's There hasn't been any experimental research that has ever demonstrated this, you know, in, in, in human beings, uh, you know, there's not much of a basis for that, that specific belief. I don't even think there's a good mechanistic basis for, for that belief in the first place, because why would that, you know, would multiple partners damage someone's ability to pair bond more than, you know, uh, one partner over a long period of time. But you do see that, that relationship between uh, promiscuity and a higher divorce rate. And that might be something that they're not totally off track with, but it's possible that they get the relationship backwards. Because what we might actually see is that people who, let's call it, you know, they have a difficulty pair bonding, or we could also say just that they have a hard time forming long-term committed relationships, they're going to have more sexual partners over time. So, you know, you do kind of see that effect, but they probably have the causality kind of reversed. That's pretty clever that the reason they have more sexual partners it, oh my god I, I can't believe i've never even considered that that the reason they have more sexual partners is because their relationships are shorter because they're less good at having relationships and then that creates an effect wow exactly and and you know something that i've noticed reading research on sexual partners 
I wrote an article about this recently. I did a, a little meta-analysis of all, all of the research I could find on this, was that physical attractiveness doesn't predict uh, the number of sexual partners someone has had very well at all, but behavioral measures really do. And a lot of those behavioral measures that predict having more sexual partners are kind of related to, uh, you know, I guess what you would call antisocial behaviors, but not like severely, like drug and alcohol use. And that's kind of, again, related to the bad boy thing, that you do see these individuals having more sexual partners over time, but it's also because those are behaviors that make it difficult for you to maintain a long-term relationship. If you're cheating, if you're using drugs, or you know, getting in fights, whatever the case may be. Wow. Okay. And so there, there is truth to the idea that having more sexual partners is maybe a you know, let's say a red flag in terms of how likely someone is to have a good relationship. But that's true for men and women. I guess I guess that's something that I would really want to drive home because I obviously my expertise from a research perspective right now, at least, is infidelity. And we do see that people with more sexual partners are more likely to commit infidelity. I don't think that's a mysterious association. People who like having sex with lots of people, that that doesn't go away when you get married. Like, there's no magic marriage button. The whole get it out of your system logic doesn't really make a lot of sense anyway. Um, But I I, I guess guess that that would be something that I would really want to drive home is that these effects are seen in men and women but the manosphere acts like for men, having sex with tons of people is good for you. And then for women, it's just like irreparably damaging. And that seems like an exaggeration on the women's side of things, but also really just wrong on the men's side of things. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's one of the big things that they they get wrong. They focus on on women entirely, which is its own discussion. Why is there so much focus on women and not on like how to improve yourself? You know, when I talk about like <laughs> what you need to do to be a good partner, a lot of times people get really mad, but that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. It's men as well. It's not just women. It's not, you know, that kind of folk wisdom that like a, you know, a key that opens many locks is a great key. It's not like that at all. Promiscuity for men and women both. Yeah. It predicts, uh, infidelity and it predicts divorce. Something I had written about in the past was there was a lot of candidate gene research that indicated, okay, we have these genetic polymorphisms that predict divorce, they predict infidelity, and they predict promiscuity. Now, a lot of those old candidate gene studies have kind of been called into question, so I wouldn't rely on that too much, but they were related, again, to, you know, oxytocin and vasopressin, so it could be that there is kind of a pair bonding failure in individuals, but again, these all applied to men and women as well. They weren't something that just applied to women. I mean, we've kind of given two accounts that are non-causal, so your account, which is super cool, and I'm going to be thinking about a lot is just that the fact that their relation that they have more partners just is actually just because they've been going through more breakups. It's not that they've been adding more partners. They've been uh, at a higher rate or something. They've just been going through more breakups and that leads to more partners. And obviously someone who's constantly, you know, sabotaging their own relationships is probably going to sabotage their marriage as well, whether through infidelity, that kind of thing. Uh, Then my non-competitive account is just, yeah, people who like having sex with lots of people, that doesn't go away when you get married. You're still going to want that, even if you don't do it. Um, but is there kind of a third? Because they always pitch it as a causal thing. Because they're always saying like, "Hey, women, don't have sex because you'll like break yourself in some way or damage yourself." Is there any potential? And obviously, we're not talking about just women. Is there any potential that like a young man who you know he goes to college and he's you know sleeping with lots of girls that he's actually setting himself up for failure later in life, or was that failure kind of coming either way my take would be that it's it, maybe it's coming either way if it's someone that's not able to form any long-term relationships you know there are perhaps ways that this could have an effect i ran a large survey recently and i don't i don't have the write-up done yet but i have managed to look through all of the data so men and women both you know they view promiscuity kind of negatively if you ask men and women like what is your ideal number of you know the body count in a potential partner For men, it was something like three. For women, it was something like five. So this is pretty low. Uh, At the same time, when I asked, like, have you asked your partner about body count? About 40% said they never even ask. So a lot of people don't even care. And then I also asked, have you ever broken up with anyone when they told you, either if you were dating or if you were in a committed relationship? And very few people had, but the ones that had, uh, the men said, okay, so the body count for women was about 20 And the women said, the man said that his body count was about 40. So it seems like it has to be pretty high to have an effect. But, you know, there there could be a causal effect. So if someone contracts, you know, an STD, for example, that could be something that hinders future relationships. If they have a really high body count, you know, much higher than a lot of the discourse would indicate, that's something that if you tell a partner, they might not like. So, yeah, there are those effects. But I think 
what I would really be concerned about, yeah, is kind of the other direction that some people are going to, you know, have more partners over a lifetime because, because they have difficulty keeping a relationship together in the first place. You know what's so funny about that, those numbers you just gave me, and this, this is likely more coincidental than anything, but that is um, from the CDC data on median body count. Um, the median body count before marriage is uh, six from, this is in non-virgins, and that probably accounts for most of the sex difference because men are more likely to be virgins lifetime than women. Um, the sex difference here is that men have a body count of six, right? A married men have a body count or a men have a body count of six before marriage and then women have a body count of four before marriage on average which with your data here that the women want five and want three if you just add one right if you're number six or number four then that's you know you're the last partner and it's it's dead on average i guess i guess i'll just kind of recount the things you're saying to me that are interesting i get because i want to make sure i've got them right about half of people don't even ask body count, which you're interpreting as they probably don't care. Very few people break up, even in dating couples that are casually dating. Very few people opt for relationship dissolution when they discover a person's body count. And of the small portion that do, the body count is actually unusually high, like 20 partners or 40 partners. This is someone who would be really on a bell curve distribution way out there. Have I got that right? Yeah, that's right. And certainly as far as like the people that don't ask, you know, I, I could interpret that as like they don't care, but we don't have to interpret it that way. They might care if they knew. They might be asking because they don't even want to know, you know. Right, yes. So those, yeah. there's other options to to interpret that. But but it doesn't seem like people are are rejecting others because of their body count very much. I noticed that CDC, actually that was, when I, when I saw that and saw the median partners for like a preferred, that was the first thing that came to my mind also was like, wow, that's really close to what the median partner count would be. Yeah. What was interesting was that very few men actually said that they wanted someone with zero partners, which is kind of contrary to a lot of the narrative as well. That men yeah, really, really want a virgin. Yeah, no, Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're dead right. I mean, the red pill, one of the weird things of the red pill narrative is that I'm sure it's true of them, right? That they're like, yeah, we wouldn't date a girl with a high body count or whatever. But their whole message that they take from that is like, well, we wouldn't. So they're just, they're doomed, right? But anyone with eyes can see that there are, you know, there, there are former female porn stars who are getting into great marriages with uh, apparently high status men. Um, there are, you know, celebrity women who have publicly dated tons of men. I guess there's no point in listing names, but, you know, p women who have dated tons of guys who are then eventually getting into these really successful marriages with super high status men. Um, yeah, I mean, th th this, this idea that and then obviously in everyone's social circle, we all know women who have dated lots of guys and then settled down. And that seems to, in fact, be the norm, right? That seems to be the normal mating pattern. So this idea that like, oh, if you don't protect your purity, no one's going to want to date you. And it's like, yeah, maybe some, you know, freaks on TikTok won't, but but someone will. Yeah, someone will. And, and so, okay, here's another piece of data from that survey. I asked men... Uh, who has not been sexually active within the last three years? I didn't ask about involuntarily celibate, which sometimes I do, but, but that's a question that correlates pretty well with individuals that do identify as involuntarily celibate. So basically men that have been sexless three years or more, they said that they wanted women with a much lower body count on average. They did actually report that it was zero, was the median. Hmm. So, Were they religious, do you think? Uh, you know, I don't have a religious measure, but I do have a political measure, a left-right political measure. I haven't looked at that yet. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, why do you think that these Manosphere guys care so much about body count? Like, I understand that if a body count was really, really high, some people would find that undesirable. The reasons that come to mind would be you're worried about potential future infidelity. Like, so that's that's quite a pragmatic um, thing, and that that's certainly one that they claim to. But another one I, I, that, that they never say, but I just personally think is probably what's going on with them is that it comes from a place of insecurity, right? Like they, they're they worried about the comparison to past partners um, or they're worried about maybe the status association in their friend group of like them, their friends making fun of them or something like that. But I'd be interested to hear why you think this subset of men, let's say this... Um, this small subset that really cares about body count numbers, even low ones, 
the why, what, what's up with those men? Why do you why do you think it's so important to them, at least in the red pill community? Sure. So yeah, kind of an exa- like I said from the data there. So we see that men that are not having sex are going to be basically more likely to be the ones that say, yeah, I want someone with a really low body count, or I want a virgin. So that raises a question: Are these men? saying this because it's kind of unattainable in a sense, and thus it makes it kind of an ego-preserving move, right? The classic story of the sour grapes. The fox comes along and the grapes are too high, and he tries to get them, he can't get them, he says, I didn't want those grapes anyway. They're kind of too sour. People do this to kind of preserve their own ego. If they're struggling in the market, you know, it might, you know, they're going to get frustrated, they're going to get angry at women often, And they might come up with these narratives to say, you know, women aren't even desirable anyway. The only desirable woman is a virgin, which is basically very few women at this point. And yeah, and that's it. uh, That's an interesting thing. So the sour grapes thing fits very well with the incel group. But let's talk about the red pillars, right? These are often men who are, um, maybe they're not sleeping with, who knows who they're sleeping with or or if they're actually saying the truth. But it does seem like a lot of these red pill guys are engaging in lots of casual sex using dating apps and things like that. Why do they want claim that they want virginity or that they want a very low number? I think this is one of those areas where where it's kind of difficult to distinguish the different manosphere communities because some of the red pill guys actually don't care that much. And they are kind of focused on casual sex, like you said. And and I don't think those are even men necessarily seeking a long-term relationship. If they're saying something about virginity, it might be a very different kind of of discourse. And then I've seen also individuals in these pickup artist communities that literally they don't care at all. And in that sense, well, have you seen the, have you seen like the fresh and sorry to interrupt. Have you seen like the fresh and fit guys though? Cause they, Uh, they're, uh, yeah. Cause they're, they're kind of advocating a bit of a playboy lifestyle and they seem to be, you know, credibly engaging in that. And yet they also claim that they wouldn't take a woman seriously if she had like five past partners, which is, you know, very slightly above average. I mean, that's, that's, that's not a, that's not by any means a high number. Um, but I, I guess I'd be curious what your perspective is on why that matters to them. Yeah. So that, that is, that does kind of require an explanation. Yeah. Because if they are sexually active and they're pursuing kind of this uh, promiscuous lifestyle, you can't just say like, oh, you know, you're mad because you know, you're not having any sex, so to speak. It also can't be a place of genuine values in terms of purity. Uh, because like, I do know, I know one man in my extended social circle who's, you know, saving himself for marriage and he wants a woman who's done the same thing, um, when he ultimately does get married. And that seems to make sense to me. But if he was, you know, being a playboy and having that expectation, I really wouldn't be able to take him seriously. And that's kind of how I view these manosphere guys. So I'm I'm just kind of curious since you've uh, interfaced with these fellas so much what do you think's going on in their head like why do you think they want why do you think they want to date virgins if they themselves are so you know uh quote unquote ran through sure sure say and 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 another thing that can't explain that as well would be disgust sensitivity which is another potential explanation i thought of is that men very high in disgust or pathogen sensitivity might kind of be more averse to like a someone with many sexual partners, but they would also be more averse to casual sex as well. So that's also not a good explanation. Here's what I think might be the case. If you have men who are very sexually active with many women, you know, they're having kind of that casual sexual lifestyle, but they don't want to marry a woman in that lifestyle. They might, that might be kind of reasonable in a sense, you know, because if their experiences with all of these women who are more promiscuous, which in many cases, you know, the kind of women they bring on their shows, you know, are going to actually be like sometimes porn actresses, uh, Instagram models. These are kind of a, a different cohort of people that don't represent kind of like the normal average woman very well. If that's kind of like their experience of women and they see that behavior, it might be kind of reasonable if they say, you know, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that's kind of very promiscuous myself, but maybe that's not kind of the person that I would want to settle down with. It does raise another question, though, if it's reasonable for them to expect, uh, you know, a nice girl at the end of of the tunnel, so to speak. Something I think the Manosphere gets wrong related to that also is they say, actually, it's very attractive to women to have many sexual partners. And then they talk about pre-selection. But I say, no, actually, the research on pre-selection is related to women finding men in relationships more attractive or men who are yep. married more attractive. And that makes sense because a woman sees someone in a, you know, that's a man, you know, literally pre-selected, but why would that be attractive to a woman? He says, okay, this is a man that has managed to attract another woman and keep her around, right? Yep. Whereas someone that had sex with many other partners, 
there's a lot of reasons why that might be less attractive. It doesn't have that same pre-selection effect. You know, like you mentioned, research tends to show that women kind of pull away from that. And why might that be, you know? Uh, aversion to disease in some sense. Uh, it shows kind of the opposite of commitment, which is kind of what women look for as well. Yeah, the, and the pre-selection thing makes a lot of sense from an evolutionary strategic perspective for men and women, where it's like, look, if you see someone in a relationship it's like it's another guy or another girl has done all the thinking for you, right? They, they've they spent presumably about a year, uh, if it's a really serious relationship, actually thinking this person through. And they've come out the other end and said, yep, I want them. They're a good choice. And that's that's actually a huge advertisement of the person's traits, like all of them. Um, it's much it's a much better, actually, endorsement than just seeing, you know, their Tinder profile. Yeah, definitely for sure. And, I, and I'm sure research on pre-selection controls for this, but in a natural environment, when someone is in a good relationship, you know, when a man is in a good relationship with a woman, she will brag about you to all of her friends and her family and everything like that. They will all grow to love you, you know, and she'll say, oh, my family loves you. My friends love you. They ask, like, where can I get a boyfriend like you and that sort of a thing. And then you have kind of that big kind of reinforcement, right? You, you Not just the pre-selection effect of seeing someone in a relationship, but they're like, wow, this woman is even like endorsing him, so to speak. Yeah, in a verbal way. And we actually, yeah. it's funny because we do have um, metrics of, and I'm saying we just in, in the sense of like evolutionary psychology and people who are, you know, human behavioral scientists generally. Um, there have been studies on mate guarding that show that people who are really, you know, insecure and think that they're very low mate value will actually do mate concealment. So they won't talk about their partner deliberately. And that's one of the really counterintuitive findings um, that comes out of our, it's, o- it's only intuitive from a strategic perspective, but it's it's counterintuitive um, from, I guess, a quote unquote, blue pill perspective. Um, I, I don't know if I don't know if I can even use that term in a reasonable way. <laughs> but we see that, um, for example, men are less likely to men and women are less likely to brag about and less likely to compliment their partners if they think their partners are actually higher mate value than themselves, right? So on a survey, they'll describe their partner as brilliant. But then in practice, they're not um, treating them that way. And it's because they don't want a, with the complimenting and the, on the other side and the really negative cases, verbal abuse, it's to keep their self-perceived mate value low. So they stay put. Um, and then on the other end, the bragging about it, the mate concealment, not taking them to parties, not introducing them to friends. It's because they're just trying to minimize competition. Um, but you're right though, that in the normal case, a secure, healthy relationship with someone who backs themselves, you'll get a lot of bragging and that'll, that'll be really good for your reputation. Yeah, yeah. I guess another, you know, uh, related to the whole discourse on virgins, certainly another interpretation of that would be that it's some kind of intersexual competition. And in this case, saying, I want a virgin and kind of, you know, slut shaming, so to speak, would not be targeted directly at the women, but rather would act as a signal to other men that's telling other men, like, stop having so much sex, you know? Yeah. That sort of a thing. So that could be another interpretation of, of that whole promiscuity discourse as well. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I'm glad you brought up intersexual competition because that's my real I'm, I'm not nearly as well versed in the manosphere stuff as you. It's not um, it's not quite as it's just not quite as central a topic in the kinds of things that I produce publicly and also, you know, in in in, in my research. But the. <laughs> I see a lot of the things they're saying and I'm like, bro, this is just blatant intrasexual competition. Like I'll see these guys who are, you know, like Rich Cooper and guys like them in their 40s and 50s. Um, you know, they're trying to date women in their 20s. That's what they say they're doing. And then what are they? what's their dating advice to men in their 20s? Don't date, right? Focus on your money right? You know, don't get into relationships. Uh, you know, women, women are most attracted to men in their thirties. So just wait until your thirties. To me, this just sounds like competition, right? It sounds like competitiveness. They're, they're sending out this signal to young men. They're, they're saying it's advice, but they know surely at some level that look, when, when young women are in these age, age mismatched relationships, they're much more likely to cheat. Um, and who do they cheat with? They cheat with young men, right? So, of course, they'd want to suppress men in their 20s from dating, and they're kind of packaging it as advice. So I see a lot of the manosphere advice is just these hyper-competitive or hyper-sexually competitive men just giving actively terrible advice to their competitors. You, you know, I totally agree with you. I've thought about this a great deal. Every time I see stuff like this, it makes me think the, the exact same thing. 
It, it, uh, yeah, a lot of the time it seems like men who might be struggling a little bit, giving this horrible advice, which is kind of having the effect of like, pull them down to my level, right? Get them out of yeah. the dating pool so I don't have to compete with them. Another example of this, because this would be an example of kind of like intersexual competition for for mates, right? Like we're going to pull them out of the dating pool. You know, I'm single. We're going to get all these other guys to be single as well. But another form of intersexual competition I see often in all of this manosphere discourse, so much of it seems to be kind of like for status, right? Male-male competition for status. And the way that that manifests is by the derogation of of other individuals who might be a higher status. I made a thread recently about, uh, what's his name? Jeff, Jeff Bezos, the, the billionaire and his new wife. And you have people just like dunking on Jeff Bezos online, you know, oh, his wife isn't pretty, oh, he's not a high value man, and all of this, this huge discourse around it. And it's like, wow, you know, this is a man, wife. yeah, this is a man who is, who is much, much higher in status than all of us, right? And how do people compete intersexually for status, right? They try to tear the other person down. And that's something that's seen in hunter gatherer societies as well across the world is that if someone is a really good hunter, you know, he brings back a lot of the meat, then all the other ones will come you kind of be like, oh, you're not such a good hunter. And that serves a role, that serves a purpose, you know, to keep these people kind of from getting out of control, you know, from getting too high status. But yeah, it's uh, so much manosphere discourse looks like that. And, it, it, you know, it's kind of like gossip. That's what gossip serves the purpose of. Oh, May, I can't talk about it yet um, because we, we really, uh, it's not really at the rollout stage, but we just got at... Um uh, at the University of Melbourne, we just got some, uh, again, Blake Lab, um, just got some really cool results on exactly what you're talking about. I guess one one thing that I, that I probably could say is just that when you see guys impugning the masculinity of like the liberal elite or whatever, um, well, who are they talking about? They're talking about guys who are more attractive to women than them because they've got more money, right? They're well-educated. Um, they've got a lot of things going for them. And so what do these, you know, lower status guys have? Well, in some cases, the only thing they can say is at the end of the day, I could kick his ass. In the case of Jeff Bezos, though, it's funny. I, I don't think that's true anymore. He looks like he's hopped on that sweet, sweet TRT and he's looking he's looking pretty big. Yeah, Bezos. Yeah, he's more jacked than than most of of the critics in the manosphere. Now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is which is a difficult situation for all of them, I'm sure. Um, yeah, he looks he looks great at the age. And so yeah, that's something I've thought about in the past that simp shaming. Does that you know, it seems like obvious uh, intersexual competition, because it's often directed at men who are in relationships, right? You have a man who's like married, you know, and, and I feel like a lot of the manosphere discourse what they have created regarding alphas and betas, they've basically categorized married men as the betas, right? They've said, oh, a married man is a beta. He's the beta simp. He's the beta provider. And it's like, this yeah. is a man who has been selected by a woman. He's probably going to be higher status on average than, than single men, according to all of the research. You know, why are people kind of derogating him since probably, yeah, because he's the one that's got the mate, right? He's the one that's going to be a little bit higher in status. Yeah, and, you know, they, they're derogating the guy who's actually going to have offspring while they... Um get vasectomies so they can, you know, lurk around the clubs in their middle age. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, I guess, um, I guess one last thing on the manosphere and the type of things that's really common in there. What's up with the decline in sex that's happening in young people? I, I guess this isn't really, re this is a much more important topic than the manosphere. It's much, it's actually, let's not talk about it through that lens. Let's give that topic a break. But is there a mating crisis? That, that That's the term that's been bouncing around quite a lot. Um, are, are people having less sex or, or, or are young people or, or, and what's behind that if that's true? And also single them. Like, are more people single? Like, I, I guess I just want to know about all the, this isn't an area of knowledge for me, but I, I hear a lot of people tweeting about it. What's, what's, what's actually happening there? Well, as far as more singles, certainly people are getting married much later. People are having much smaller families. So it's also kind of related to that, you know, so-called fertility crisis. But as far as the mating crisis specifically, I think interest on this began uh, maybe around 2016, 2018. And then the General Social Survey was published, published a chart which was uh, looking at sexlessness over the last year. It indicated that, whoa, Sexlessness has shot way up. Go to 2021, the same survey indicated, you know, even a little bit higher, and it was higher for men and women. So you have over these different years, people kind of speculating based on that data and other data sets as well that showed that sexlessness had increased. Why might this be? And one of the ideas was kind of like an extended adolescence and kind of a shift away from risk aversion, which means what exactly? 
uh, young individuals are drinking less, they're using drugs less, they're engaging in less antisocial behavior. They have much smaller friend groups on average. They're not getting their driver's licenses early. They're not entering university or uh, working as early. And all of those, you know, they're living at home for longer as well. All of these things kind of come together that might have shot up this, this sexlessness, especially in the youngest demographics. Now, something very interesting. The General Social Survey for 2022 was just released like two days ago. At the Institute of Family Studies, Nicholas Wolfganger, he ran it. And then just this morning or yesterday morning, I did as well. And sexlessness is actually way down. Now, this is a smaller sample, but it might be that we're seeing kind of a return to normalcy. Why was there sexlessness? Even if there's not now, why was there? One hypothesis would be COVID, right, in 2021. That, you know, forced people to stay inside. So that might have caused an artificial uh, bump in sexlessness, even if there was an ongoing trend. It's... You know, it might still be the case. You know, we just have one recent data set that says, you know, maybe it's reversed a little bit. It, it, I wouldn't rely too much on that, given how much other data has indicated. But, but I think probably the best explanation for that now is kind of this risk aversion that we may be seeing in young individuals, that they have much smaller friend groups, that they're, you know, engaging in much less risk behavior that's associated with sexual activity staying inside more, even use of social media has been linked to it. There's been a recent paper that said, okay, uh, alcohol use can explain 20% of the decline, and then video game use in men can explain like another 10 to 15% of the decline. So a lot of people are just staying online at this point. Wow, interesting. Well, what, what else is causing this risk aversion trend? It's difficult to to imagine what, what could be causing it. And I think, you know, I think that's the puzzle right now. That's a mystery. And I don't even have an explanation for why individuals might be more risk averse. I think one, you know, I think there might be different reasons. I think one potential explanation could actually be lower testosterone levels on average. And there's so much discourse about that that I think is very kind of hyped up. But I, I do think that might play into it to some extent. Yeah, I mean, given how much lower they are, it would be kind of weird if there was no effect. I know that testosterone is kind of memefied into like the only important hormone, which is really stupid, but it, it does it does matter and there is a decline. So it'd be kind of weird if there was no effect, but it's also hard to know how much the cart is following the horse because we also see that testosterone declines situationally in males um, towards utility, right? Like if you compete over mates more, your testosterone will go up. And if you get yourself in a situation where you're not really competing, right, like you've got a pregnant wife at home and two young children with you, your testosterone is going to be about half what it would have been if um, you were vigorously competing with mates. So it feels like it's it's a response to environment as well as a driver of environment. Um, but uh, gosh, it, it is it is an interesting topic, I guess, then that mating crisis, uh, maybe not anymore. Um, and if there was one, it seems to be related to this risk aversion, which is a bigger trend. That remains unexplained. Is that a good summary of what you're saying? I would think so. And I, and I think even risk aversion might be just one thing that goes into it. I think there might be a bunch of different trends that have contributed to this. We see rising obesity for one, you know, and, and as much as people talk about body positivity and that sort of thing, people are attracted to kind of a conventional look, which is typically, you know, not a larger body in that sense. And, and so even those things make the mating pool smaller and you have, you know, something like risk aversion here. You have rising obesity over here. You have lower testosterone in, in, in this case. And so you kind of have a perfect storm that might yeah. be pulling people out. Yeah. It might be overdetermined. That's interesting. Okay, cool. I guess, um, I guess we'll move from that into a kind of final section that I have here. I, I would love to know, cause you're, you're more reticent than most people, um, talking about online, um, Talk, talking about dating online, I, I keep having to avoid the term online dating because that now means something completely different, of course. Do you have uh, any dating advice for uh, for men and women, uh, maybe separately, maybe together? Sure. So the first piece of dating advice that I always go forward toward uh, is telling people, you know, hit the gym, try to get really physically fit. And why is that? So research is pretty consistent, you know, that physical attractiveness is pretty important. You know, people say things like, you can't change your face very much. That may or may not be true, but you can change your body a great deal. If you can build a nice body as a man or a woman, you know, that will set you kind of into a tier of individuals uh, apart from that. Another important thing, I think, for, for men in particular is kind of to continue in school. And this is not something that can be done easily, but, you know, a lot, we're seeing now more women into the university, fewer men, if that's good or bad, you know, a whole 
debate on that. But I think it's important for men to continue pursuing education uh, just from kind of the bus status perspective. Two of the top signs of status for men was kind of like related to uh, getting a degree, basically. That's kind of like one of the big, big status symbols in Western society that automatically puts people into a different pool of, of, of daters. And there's been research on dating apps to indicate, you know, someone that has a bachelor's degree gets something like two to three times more matches. Someone that has a master's degree in their dating app bio gets a similar amount of matches. So it's a, these are all things that uh, kind of boost attractiveness, both online and, and apps and, and in dating in general. Anything else? Well, as far as for for online specifically or for relationships more broadly, I think for relationships, relationships more broadly and online dating, I'm just trying to drag some advice out of the uh, <laughs> out of the legendary date psych who uh, gives us all the research and uh, doesn't tell us what to do with it. People ask me for advice so much, and and I give so little advice because I think all of the dating advice to me it seems like what works is such a small uh, kind of collection of advice you could just fit it into you know a few paragraphs which is like okay you have to kind of maximize your physical attractiveness right you have to take care of, of, of your appearance whatever the case may be and I say you know I, I said get fit hit the gym is one thing but you know if it's like if someone needs braces get braces if, if they have to fix their hair up or wear makeup or whatever the case may be for for a woman that's it so maximizing physical appearance is very important anyone out there telling themselves you know like it doesn't matter the way that you look they're going to struggle a lot another would be to behave in ways that are broadly uh, pro-social. And people sometimes interpret that as kind of like a nice guy thing. But pro-social behavior is something very closely associated with status increases. And this is true both for men and women. And that's kind of related to education as well. It's something that will put someone kind of into a different dating pool. Something else people need to do. Uh, we're seeing a trend right now that we mentioned kind of in the in the sex drought, right? In the, in the mating crisis is that people have very, very, very small friend groups. A lot of people are not in any position to be put into contact with members of the opposite sex. They're very, very isolated. And I think this can contribute a great deal to it. A lot of people will go on apps and that sort of thing and they won't have much success and they'll get frustrated and they'll kind of give up when maybe they should be looking for friend groups and hobbies that put them into contact with members of the other sex in large groups, something like, you know, like volleyball, a sport or like dancing, you know, ballroom dancing, those sorts of things. Awesome. Okay. Well, I, I won't drag any more out of you. Um, but, but it was, it was good to hear just that. I think that's very good advice, uh, that everyone should take if they're, especially if they're single and looking, uh, Alexander, thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, you really are my favorite science communicator in the world right now. I hope you keep it up and, uh, you couldn't have put yourself towards a better topic at a better time. I, I'm really, I'm really grateful for your voice on these things. And, uh, this is one of the few subjects where I have enough, uh, I have enough educational backgrounds to separate the uh, bullshitters from the people who actually know what they're saying. And uh, you're definitely in the latter category. And I spoke very slowly there, so I didn't accidentally say former. I'll continue to be watching closely. Thanks again for uh, coming on the show. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Thank you again to Alexander. Thank you to everyone for listening. And thank you to the donors who support the show. If you want more content from Alexander, check out his blog, datepsychology.com, his YouTube, which is linked over there. But I really recommend him on Twitter, at datepsych. That is where the fun is happening for him. If you want more content from me, TikTok is where the fun is happening right now. And uh, I just released a new series on infidelity on the TikTok app for $1.99. But if you don't have two bucks and you do want to watch that series, reach out to me at macandmurphy.org. Uh, the contact forms are pretty simple over there. And sincerely, I'll figure something out. I can't afford not to make money from doing creative work at this age. And while there are some products, such as, you know, my children's book, let's say, that can't really work without money, I sincerely don't want a lack of money to be the only reason someone can't access my content. So again, we'll figure something out. But if you can buy it, it is very cheap and the support really is appreciated. Thanks again for everything. And until next time, remember to be kind to animals.